Well, if Wheaton College Professor Del Case is back at the Thomas Crane Public Library, that must have something to do with music. And it does. The next couple of months, it is how to listen to classical music. Four separate presentations. Del's here now to give us a little preview. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you, Joe. Hard to believe. Here we are again. I know. But, uh, you know, it's cold outside, but uh, we're going to heat it up at the library with some classical music. All right. Wow. Well, I know some of those classical music composers and performers were kind of avant-garde for their day and time, for sure. So. Well, that's the thing about classical music is you sort of think of it as this big category. And, you know, if you're a kid, you might think boring or whatever. But mm -hmm. the fact is that, as with any kind of music, there is good stuff and there's bad stuff. And there's a lot of middle-of-the-road stuff that is kind of not very interesting. Right. But, you know, the thing about classical music is there's been several hundred years for the good stuff to rise to the top. Um, so all it really takes is, I think, a little, a little key to unlock the pleasures of classical music. So I'm hoping that for this series about how to listen to classical music and the history of classical music, we get a, a group of people who maybe don't know much about classical music, uh, maybe want to try it, mm -hmm. because it's amazing how if you learn just a few things, you can really recognize how exciting it, it is, all to right. be honest with you. Well, these are uh, every other Tuesday from February uh, 6th through March the 20th. Uh, these are in the evenings, right, 7 to 8.30 p.m. So do they go in, uh, in progression, Del, or each, is each one kind of individual? Yes, yeah, so we're going to okay. start with uh, how to listen to classical music. That's going to be the first presentation. Um, so we'll talk about way actually sort of we'll try to talk about ways that you use your brain and your ears when you hear classical music and they're very similar to the ways that you listen to any other kind of music but there are a couple of special sort of skills and tools and even sort of vocabulary words if you will that I'm going to teach and uh, immediately I mean my, my guarantee is that you'll never hear classical music diff uh, the same after leaving the class what? because basically they're just a couple of things which if you know what to listen for can really change what you think and help you understand it better. Okay. So that's the first one. All and right. then we'll do uh, chronologically, we'll start with medieval and renaissance music. Um, the, a couple weeks later, that's with starting with Gregorian chant um, and moving up until the great choral music of Palestrina, the, the core of the Catholic music, mm. church music tradition, the okay. great masses. A couple weeks later, then we'll do the Baroque and the, and the classical period with Bach and Mozart and Haydn and Beethoven. What we mostly think of when we think of classical music. Absolutely, right? yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, and the development of opera as well. Oh. And then in, then we'll move on to the, um, to the Romantic period, which has probably the f most favorite pieces of music that we know, whether it's Brahms or the Nutcracker or, you know, uh, Tchaikovsky's mm. 1812 Overture, sure. that kind of stuff, yeah. all that big stuff, uh, Grand Opera, Puccini, and okay. you know, et cetera, Wagner. Uh, and then the last session we'll do music since the end of the 19th century, which you might call modern music if it wasn't 150 years old <laughs> right now. And that's most of the most interest to me because as, I'm, as a composer myself, uh, uh, this is the music that sounds a little bit closer to the kind of music that I, I write. Um, and there's such a wide variety of stuff, including, you know, over the last 100 years, music by women and composers who are not white men, which mm. frankly really broadens and changes the way classical music sounds. Interesting. And that's really important to introduce people to those that kind of music. Okay. Are there certain components that have to be met in order for it to be called classical music? That's a great question, and I don't think I can answer it very quickly. Okay, okay. But you know what? Most people hear an orchestra playing, and they think that it's classical music. Yeah. And that's one way to define it, the use of the string orchestra. Right, yeah. But there are really uh, much sort of deeper and more complicated ways to define it. In fact, I was just thinking about this the other day at the Y, because that's what I do at the Y, think about music. Um, <laughs> I mean, I really think that a lot of the music of the Beatles should be considered or will be considered classical music in 100 years. Really? Because the way that they approach writing music and organizing it, it's so creative yeah. and it's so different and it moves from moment to moment in such interesting ways. This is what Beethoven was doing. Now, okay. it didn't sound the same. And they call it movements, right? So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. So right. if you think that's a radical thing to say, well, you have to come <laughs> my first session. <laughs> All right. Because I, I, know, I think that we're going to learn how to hear music uh, in, in ways that are, that are new and hopefully will equip people to really appreciate classical music yeah. more. Well, you, you know, you say two interesting things. There's there's hearing, and then there's listening. So th I think those are two different distinctions, really. Yeah. Um, hearing is passive, generally. Right, right. Like when you go to, you go to the movies, mm -hmm. you might hear the music in the background. Right. You might even pay attention a little bit, but you never listen to it. Right. Yep. You don't, yeah. Each individual uh, component of it, right, you're going to break it down. But as with everything, yep. the more you put in, the more you get out. Yep. So if you sit down without your phone and you listen to Beethoven, <laughs> you're going to get more out of it, even if you don't come to my class. All right. You know, but very rarely do any of us do that anymore. It's true. It's you true. You know, especially yeah. something that's 
not visual. Yeah. Closing your eyes and listening to music is yeah. a thing that, well, you shouldn't do in the car. Correct. To be honest. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> if you're not in the car. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, in the back. Yeah, exactly. But, um, you know, so even just the idea of um, experiencing something in the world that f causes you to focus. Yeah. I mean, we're losing that art. Yeah, it, uh, interesting. I, I think that it, it's more pronounced when it's not there. I mean, it, it's mm. kind of like, you know, the deadly silence uh, when it's yeah. not there. That's when it's, it's most missed. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. So I like to think that, well, like, the way that I've learned how to listen to music and focus my attention on things coming in the audio realm has helped me be, a, in generally, a little, a little happier person mm -hmm. because... When I go outside and I don't have anything to do, so let's say I left my phone in the car, yeah. just shutting my eyes and listening to all the sounds, yep. the birds, even the cars, yep. the sirens, like this, in a sense, it's not music, but it's a way of engaging with the world that's not visual, you know? It's what blind people, I'm sure, uh, you know, have the most heightened sense, yeah, absolutely. It sounds like, a, it sounds really fascinating, and, and as an audiophile myself, uh, I may attend these, Dell. Yeah, <laughs> that'd be great. You might see me in the back. <laughs> and you know what's great is now, if you have access to the internet, yes. any piece of music I play for you, you can hear immediately at okay. home. In the old days, you'd have to go to the library or to your friend's house to borrow an LP or something, right, right. or yeah. hope it shows, plays on the radio. But now, if you hear a little tiny snippet of a piece that you never heard before, you can listen to it every day if you want. That's true, yeah, and you can home. find it in, in no time at all. Interestingly, a lot of um, cartoons use classical music, uh, you know, in, in places that are just kind of in modern pop culture that, uh, that, that people don't realize. Absolutely, yeah. in fact, that's one way that a lot of young people so a couple of generations ago, first got exposed to classical music. Right. Today, we don't really have that. There's the use of the orchestra in, in movies, but you know what? It's not the classics. Right. And so um, it, it's a missed opportunity, I think, to, 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 forget, to get kids into music. All right. Sounds fascinating. Thanks again for coming to the library, and Absolutely. thanks for coming here to QATV and telling us about it. Always happy to do it. Thank you. You are welcome. And again, that's How to Listen to Classical Music with Wheaton College Professor Dell Case, February 6th, 20th, March 6th, and March 20th from 7 to 8.30 p.m. To learn more about this or any of the programs at the library, you know where to go. Their website, thomascranelibrary.org.